Hi, everyone. We're just getting everybody into the room. Thank you for joining. We'll get started in just another couple of minutes, maybe a minute. Thanks for being here. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. We'll just wait another about 30 seconds and we'll get started with some background materials. So good to have you all here. Hi, thanks for joining. This is green infrastructure and gentrification. Harness the benefits, avoid the displacement. Welcome. Welcome everybody. Everybody, there's still some people coming in, but I am going to go ahead and move on to the the welcome. Green infrastructure and gentrification harness the benefits, avoid the displacement. This is a a learning session hosted by the Urban Waters Learning Network. My name is Renee Mazurik. I'm I use she/her pronouns, and I'm the Resilient Communities Manager at River Network. We've got people joining. Thank you for being here. I'm calling in today from Asheville, North Carolina, where I live, work, and play on the traditional lands of the Cherokee. Um, and I'm joined by my colleague, Deanna Toledo, who will who is also actually in Asheville. And she'll be dropping things in the chat and moderating some discussion later. Thank you for being here. Um, just a little note, River Network does the land acknowledgments out of recognition and respect to keep salient the history of colonialism and recognizes the continued presence and contributions made by indigenous peoples in the conservation space today. We recognize that we cannot change the past and also acknowledge that doing these kinds of acknowledgments of native history and presence is simply a first step. So if you're comfortable, go ahead and share some information about yourself in the chat box, your organization, the native lands from which you're joining, and your pronouns if you are comfortable. We also have a post-event survey. This is the first time you'll see that link. Um, we'll have it by the end of the session as well. So just to move on a little bit of information about who is the Urban Waters Learning Network. We are co-facilitated by Groundwork USA and River Network um, and funded by the EPA's Urban Waters Program. So we deliver tools, training, mentoring, and financial assistance to support the work of Learning Network members as they collaborate and develop solutions and elevate community priorities um, on things like resilience and uh, flooding, uh, water quality issues, green spaces, and different um, community priorities like that. So you can you can meet the network and access our resources at urbanwaterslearningnetwork.org. Hi to everyone. I keep seeing more people coming into the room. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Um, I, I want to point out that this this session comes to us via the Urban Waters Learning Network Equitable Development and Anti Displacement Collaborative. So the collaborative um, convenes network leaders from around the country who participate, and we meet almost monthly, and we've been at this for almost three years now, which is amazing. We've developed some great relationships um, and identified commonalities in the work that everyone is doing, particularly around displacement pressures in their communities as a result of greening efforts and infrastructure investments. And so, be it coastal resilience or river restoration, um, there's a lot of commonalities in this group. Um, so we we meet, we develop, and highlight resources um, that can be found on our collaborative landing page. So we have webinars kind of like this, or peer calls where we have more um, facilitated discussions, and those recordings are on our landing page, as well as a story map and some other resources that you can access on the talk topic of equitable development and anti-displacement. And it's from these conversations with these network leaders that brings us here today. And some of those leaders are actually on the call with us, so I just want to give a shout out and say hi and thank you. We 
so grateful for all of your contributions to the Learning Network. Um, so before I hand it over to our awesome panelists today, I do want to um, to poll the audience to, to get some feedback from all of you. So, and the question is, to what extent is your community experiencing displacement pressures due to gentrification? And Deanna, do you, can you start that poll? Yep. Okay, thank you. And we'll just take a little bit of time to go ahead and try to answer this particular question. There's still people coming into the room. Thank you so much for being here. If you're just joining, we're polling and we'll get to our speakers in just a moment. And we're above 50% answers. Just we'll give it maybe 30 more seconds. If you haven't had a chance to weigh in, please do so. Thank you. All right. I think, Deanna, we're probably good to end the- Okay, I'll poll. go ahead and close it now and share the results. Thank you. I don't know if I can see it. So so it's, it's interesting. There is nobody who is, who is not seeing this at all. Um, and that's exactly why we're doing these, we're having these conversations, right? There's some of you who may not know, and that's fine as well. Um, but overwhelmingly, 42%, a significant number of residents and local businesses are, are being displaced. And so that's concerning. Um, and so we're here to talk a little bit about um, some of some anti-displacement strategies, and we'll get to that from our speakers as well. So I, I, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce you to our panel today. Um, I'll give you a brief intro. Um, just to note that the recording, the slides, and the resources will be sent after this session, and I'll also include um, a, a longer bio for each one of our presenters that are here today. So we have with us Jen McGraw, the Director of Sustainability Innovation at the Center for Neighborhood Technology. Jen leads CNT's strategy to promote sustainable anti-poverty solutions for communities and manages CNT's West Coast office. Jen has led projects analyzing the property value impacts of green stormwater infrastructure and helping communities translate those findings into anti-displacement strategies. We also have with us Barbara Hopkins from uh, the Barbara is a lawyer and, a, and landscape architect who serves as executive director of the Green Infrastructure Leadership Exchange, which activates local governments and water agencies in the United States and Canada to equitably implement green stormwater infrastructure. With um, Barbara today are a couple of her partners in this work. Beatrice Ohine Oke is an environmental protection specialist with the District of Columbia's Department of Energy and Environment. She is a member of DOEE's Green Infrastructure Incentives and Assessment Branch and also serves as the co-chair of the Equity Committee. And last but not least, Jeff Smith is a stormwater engineering supervisor at Catsap County Public Works. She focuses on stormwater assets to ensure they are functioning optimally. And when there are failures, she leads to leads the design to retrofit what is needed. So we're very grateful for our speakers. And um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Jen. So let me get Jen's slides. Thanks, Renee. Oh. Of course. Let Thanks all for being here. And thank you for having me. Um, Jen McGraw, I'm with the Center for Neighborhood Technology, uh, which is based in Chicago. I'm based in San Francisco. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, San Francisco is the home of the Ramaytu Shaloni people. Um, and today I am talking about some work that CNT did a couple of years ago um, that's published uh, that you all can use as you see fit, but also what we're doing with that work in the intervening years. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, 
if you don't know CNT, check us out. Uh, we do analysis and solutions for community-based organizations, local governments. We've been in the urban sustainability space for over 40 years. Uh, we work all over the US and we try to do very uh, peer-reviewed technical research, but then go out and try to get things done also. Next slide. Uh, so as an example of this, we were out in the field of practice and we heard from folks that um, leadership, especially that they didn't know what the property value impacts of distributed green stormwater infrastructure were. So when you're doing rain gardens, when you're doing bioswales, what does that mean for um, the sales value of the properties in the neighborhoods. And so we uh, got some support from the Cresby Foundation and we set out to find the answer to that. Um, we brought on SB Friedman, uh, which is an, an analytical firm. And we wanted to know uh, if there were changes to the residential real estate value in communities that had implemented green stormwater infrastructure. And then we, hoped that we would have an answer clear enough that we could start to talk about, could you use that to finance GSI? What does it mean for displacement um, gentrification? Next slide, please. So to cut to the chase, we found <laughs> that there was a small property value increase from distributed stormwater infrastructure. Uh, in particular, rain gardens, swales, planters, um, the kind of you know individual residential property scale type stuff. So here's what we didn't look at, right? Uh, there's already really strong evidence about trees. You know, appraisers when they appraise a home, they appraise the trees. That's very documented. We didn't look at that. We didn't look at parks for similar reasons. That was very well documented. Um, we did not look at landscape scale green stormwater infrastructure. So. There are some very high profile examples right now, the 606, the High Line, where these really large neighborhood scale projects are just transformational to a neighborhood. And we instead looked at these sort of block by block distrib distributed um, improvements to see what that meant. And what we're finding is, you know, it's an order of magnitude less impact, <laughs> but it's not no impact. So. Uh, you know, less than 1% of a home value is still big money in a lot of places. And um, I'll talk a little bit about how we got to these findings. And then I will also talk about what we think they mean. So you go to the next slide. So we looked at three cities and we looked at actual home sales data um, before and after significant green stormwater infrastructure was implemented. Um, we spatially joined that with GSI data sets. Um, this is where I say, if you haven't geocoded or mapped <laughs> your green stormwater infrastructure, please do so. It really helps for understanding what impact it's having. Um, we ran into a little hiccup where some of the geocoding wasn't specific enough, right? It was just like, oh, somewhere on the block, there's like some mysterious amount of stormwater infrastructure. And that meant we couldn't analyze it statistically. So we had to we had to do a lot of cleaning up of data. Um, and then we did a big model. Uh, I will show you on the next slide. It got pretty complicated. You can read all about it. I won't talk all about it. But basically, you know, we we held constant all the other things that we know impact home value, right? Number of bedrooms, the lot size, amenities, are you near transit? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to try to get to what was the impact of being near something like a reading garden. So if you go to the next slide. So here's an example. We have this GSI data on the left. You can see there's a few little implementations of green infrastructure in this neighborhood. And then we put a 250 foot buffer around it. And then we pulled the property sales in that buffer um, into the data when we ran the analysis. Next slide. So uh, as I said, we created a typology of green infrastructure types and the type that um, I think we often talk about and I think had the most like clear, you know, less than 1% positive property value impact is the sort of rain garden, 
um, swale type uh, green infrastructure. And so we have a tool at CNT. Um, can put the link into the chat, maybe, folks. And our green values calculator lets you look at a property and say, what if I put these green infrastructure types on my property? How much stormwater could I manage? And we added some of this information about property values to that. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you can see we did think about <laughs> what does that mean for financing, right? So if you get a big property value change from an investment, theoretically, you could leverage that to help finance the investment. But, you know, it's not this distributed type of green infrastructure, like just rain gardens, the impact isn't quite big enough to use that as like the financing tool. You can see in our in our paper um, that you could make it part of a package for certain. Um, if you're doing a bunch of other things, this certainly could be part of that finance, but it doesn't necessarily stand on its own. Um, there are other larger scale GSI that we know about that might, right? So I don't want to make that a blanket statement. Um, but so that was sort of our first finding is that it does create value. Um, you can't necessarily run the whole project um, paying for it with that property value increment alone. There are a million other co-benefits or that, you know, they do add up for sure. Um, but then we really wanted to think about what does that mean for the folks who live in these communities and how even a small property value uh, increase could create neighborhood insecurity. So in our write up a couple of years ago, we, we did address some first steps of, you know, if you're thinking about doing green infrastructure, start from day zero of including the community in that dialogue. Is this even the kind of stuff that's needed in this neighborhood? Uh, are there other investments that are needed in parallel to make this a livable place? Who is going to get the benefits of this um, improvement? Who owns it? Who gets to stay if the property values change? You know, all of those really crucial issues that sometimes get kind of tucked on at the end of a project, bring them up front and really talk about them and create maybe some different uh, program and operational structures to enable that. Um, and think about who's getting paid to design the work, to promote the work, <laughs> to do the work, to maintain the work, and make sure that the, the value stream of these types of investments is accruing to the folks who need it. Um, and if you go to the next slide, so once we had done all that, we really were thinking about how does this how does this apply in community? So we started talking to cities. Um, new, so we talked to folks in New Orleans, Buffalo, and a little bit in Milwaukee. Um, and what we found, of course, <laughs> is that uh, gentrification displacement is an issue much, much bigger than a rain garden. Um, right, there are big international forces at play here that uh, we didn't want to lose sight of. So uh, I'm not going to read every word on this slide, but just big picture. The big line on the right um, is, you know, if you if you peg housing to 100 in the 80s, it is now skyrocketed above that on average in the U.S. Right, purchased housing, home ownership is really out of reach for a lot of Americans, and that has just has just increased exponentially in recent years. So what is driving that? We've done a lot of talking to housing experts and thinking about that because we wanna understand which parts of that are uh, actionable <laughs> by green stormwater actors, which ones are things that they need to activate other groups to work, you know, and work with folks who are working on these issues, which ones are things that are maybe beyond what a community at the local scale can do. Is it a state issue? Is it a, you know, federal home loan bank issue, right? So we're, we're big systems thinkers at CNT. So we like to look at these big picture issues um, to really understand where the points of leverage of making change are. Um, the the chart or the map on the right shows you that if you even peg to inflation, um, this is from the Joint Center for Housing Studies, 
the, the number of apartments that are $600 or less, so really truly affordable and very like entry level income for many people is just fallen in many states. So that, you know, we're all seeing this in our communities, like the affordability crisis is very real. Um, so I just wanna kind of level set with that understanding. You can go to the next slide. So here are the type of things that we're working on as we build out toolkits for community and for green stormwater implementers. Um, to, to make sure that we're not putting the entire burden of the housing <laughs> crisis on like any given project, but that projects are created with this context in mind. Because I think if you come into it like this is not our problem, you're not, like, you might be contributing to the problem, right? Like if you really uh, silo the, the decision down to, well, I have this grant and I'm just trying to make this, get this grant out the door and get it built then you're not contextualizing to the reality of the people who live there and work there. Um, so here are the, the some of the <laughs> lessons we're building out. You know, some of these are real basic to everything we work on. You know, look at what's working in the community and scale it up. Don't do everything yourself. There are already folks in your community working on housing, working on transportation, uh, workforce development. Uh, don't recreate the wheel. But I think uh, increasingly we're thinking about how does this type of necessary engagement scale across categories, right? It's not just green infrastructure having these discussions, it's transportation, it's energy, it is workforce, it's housing. And residents only have so many hours in the day and, and there needs to be a way that they um, are being served by implementers rather than them having to sort of come to the implementers and always be asking. Uh, so next slide, and these slides will be available after the talk, so don't feel like you have to write everything down. <laughs> uh, this is just a very draft early example of the types of matrices that we're building out, right? So uh, we're looking at what's a di displacement risk in a community, and then what are the best practice solutions? And the other columns that go here are who who's going to do those, who's able to do those, what are the sort of uh, necessary next steps, and how how can you get to there? So, for example, you know, push Buffalo in New York. Um, as we were talking about green green infrastructure with them, they had a team going to the state and working on renters' rights. Um, you know, they're an amazing organization; they're doing amazing things, and I think that it's a great example that they saw, you know, this wasn't purely a local issue um, and that these things are interconnected. Um, what else does, folks can ask questions about this one if we come to, <laughs> if there's time, I won't say too much more about this one. You can go to the next slide. So a couple other things we're thinking about as we do this work, um, CNT spent a lot of years sort of making the case for green stormwater infrastructure. We're finding the case is, is relatively made now. There's still some work to do, but that, that's, that's not the start of the conversation in a lot of circles anymore. And the funding is increasingly available. Still work to do there, but it, you know, that's sort of the tables, the table is set a little differently than it was a decade ago. Um, but the need for equity focused investment is really crucial as these flows of funds come in. And there are a lot of tools <laughs> available to help you map up equity or figure out you know where the change is needed and the tools alone don't drive action so that there's some gaps there where where high priority needs of communities need to be better integrated to the process of this work and that's kind of what we're working on and what's upcoming um and the multi-problem solving that's needed to really address the the climate change moment we're in so here's a link about our uh, uh, newsletter, and you'll hear about our upcoming work. We have some of this coming out in writing, so apologies if the text was small on the screen. It'll be available in publication at some point soon. Um, we have some fact sheets for practitioners coming out, and we're continuing to do technical assistance for communities. So if you're interested in talking to us more about this, we could talk about it all day, but I will um, hand it back to Renee so we can keep this webinar moving forward.
Thank you so much, Jen. And I'm going to hand it right over to Barbara. We will have time for questions, but I think we're going to save that for after both speakers. So go ahead and add your questions in the chat or hold on to them until um, after these speakers. So Barbara, I think you should be able to go ahead and share your screen. Yeah. One second. Okay. Good job. Oh, oh, thank you, Renee. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Urban Waters uh, Learning Network and the River Network uh, for being such great partners in the water field and for inviting uh, the exchange to be a part of this today. Um, <clears throat> Barbara, I'm going to pause you for just one second. If you can switch your display settings on your sure. presentation. We're seeing the, the notes in the upcoming slide. Okay. And we have time, so no worries. <laughs> Let me see. Um, still seeing the yeah do you want me to go ahead and share your slides yeah why don't you do that renee okay let me go ahead and grab those Give me a second. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Give me just a sec. There we go. Are we seeing that? Okay. Yeah, just go ahead and give me a heads up when you need me to switch. Okay, next slide, please. Yes, so uh, briefly what we hope today is uh, to do is to provide a brief overview of the uh, Green Infrastructure Leadership Exchange, uh, talk just briefly about the importance of preventing displacement, and then offer some best practices and examples from the exchange's equity guide. Uh, members are the heart of uh, our social impact network, and I'm uh, so fortunate to have two of them with me today to do the heavy lifting here of presenting. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jess Smith, an exchange member who is a professional engineer from Kitsap County, Washington. Thanks so much, Barbara. Um, yeah, so I, I work out in Kitsap County in stormwater engineering, doing GSI projects, among other things, and happy to be part of the Green Infrastructure Leadership Exchange and happy to be here today just to talk a little bit about it. Uh, next slide, please, Renee. All right. So the Green Infrastructure Exchange's mission is to activate local governments and stormwater ag agencies in the U.S. and Canada to implement green stormwater infrastructure equitably. Um, the vision of the exchange is to show up with courage, consistency, and voice in pursuit of a myriad of ways, um, which... Uh, I, I won't have time to talk about all the different ways that we show up, um, but there's a lot. In the next few slides, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about why this is our mission and the unique uh, attributes that we have to it. Uh, next slide, please. So a little background about the exchange. Um, it's been around for seven years and it was created in 2016. It now recruits about 54 local governments and 360 members across the U.S. and Canada. And that um, amounts to serving about 15 to 18% of the U.S. population. 
the way it began was from two groups of professionals on the West Coast and the East Coast that got together and decided that this would be a really empowering um, thing to offer to GSI professionals so that uh, there was a methodology in order to um, impact and different locations in an equitable way. Next slide, please. Okay, so the exchange's approach to delivering this uh, mission is unique. And I'm going to just share a quote on this page from a book, which aligns to the mentality of the exchange. So a group of individuals seeking to solve difficult problems in society by working together, adapting over time and generating a sustainable flow of activities and impacts. And if you just click again, it'll define individuals. So individuals are local governments, GSI practitioners in the US and Canada, environmental scientists and others. Problems, um, problems are how we can utilize GSI to comply with regulatory requirements for managing stormwater, while also realizing co-benefits that will ameliorate historic inequalities in disadvantaged communities. Next. And activities include peer learning, uh, re-grant programs, leadership and community engagement training, evidence-based uh, approaches. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. If you'll click one more time and impacts um, highlights the innovations of GSI practice that will ensure that GSI implementation lives up, up to its promise as a solution to both stormwater management and improving livability in disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities. And so the way that um, this mission is put into action is by utilizing three different pillars. Um, the three pillars of leadership exchange are leadership itself, and you become a leader by attending trainings, which are provided. Um, also, the next pillar is uh, implementation. And so there are opportunities to implement and steps outlined for how to implement GSI projects. And then the third problem, the third pillar is evidence-based method. And so that speaks to uh, the iterative and ongoing cycle of as, as you uncover um, new methods to um, implement projects or as you uncover new innovations that help with GSI, bringing that into the vocabulary that's offered to other exchange members. Okay, next slide. Okay, an equity lens. It compels us to better understand who benefits from green infrastructure who is marginalized from these benefits, and that a person's race, wealth, zip code, and other forms of systemic and historical oppression are, do not define the standards of water. They don't define the standards of open space or other green infrastructure benefits. Um, and so here the quote is, low income communities and communities of color deserve to benefit from green infrastructure without fear of being displaced by its installation or resulting property value increases. So being aware of that. Next slide. Uh, the equity guide. So this is a PDF document. It uh, is 149 pages and full of so much good information. Um, it talks about uh, the variety of best practices and tools that GSI leaders can use while um, that they can use while planning and implementing uh, GSI equitably within their communities. Um, let's see, it's really thorough and it in general, it outlines um, the process of how to plan, how to do, how to check what you're doing is done correctly and how to act. So there's those, those four steps planning, doing, checking, acting. And within each of those, it's broken down to even smaller bits so that it really provides, there you go, it really provides um, stepping stones for how to, how to go about designing in an equitable way and making sure that um, you're, you're, you're aware of all the different um, elements that go into that kind of design. Yeah, you can keep going. Yeah, and again, the audience is 
is for professionals, cities, the audience is really everybody, everybody who would be doing GSI pro, pro, program managers and their supporting teams. Next slide. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah, so we're focusing on seven goals for uh, ensuring equitable uh, GI implementation, which are outlined on the right, um, internal readiness, uh, centering, community, so making sure you are connected with the community that's benefiting. Um, and then there's, yeah, so th there's a lot here that's uh, outlined and all of these are steps that go into planning and that are outlined in this document, just to make sure that, um, again, it's, you're, you're being aware of all the different steps um, that need to go into making sure that there's an equitable approach to this process. Okay, next slide. And I think here, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to my colleague, Beatrice. Yeah, thanks, Jess. Um, that was a really helpful um, overview. And thank you, Barbara, also for um, the introduction. Um, so just picking up into a deeper dive of um, the uh, preventing displacement chapter within the equity guide. Um, for each project where displacement is either a real or perceived risk, the equity guide recommends working with communities to proactively engage in conversations and in dialogue um, that uh, can help mitigate the risk as, it's, as, it, as it relates, excuse me, to green infrastructure, um, as well as including green infrastructure um, and anti-displacement efforts. Um, experts, excuse me, um, such as individuals that are involved in affordable housing work um, within the conversation, um, as well as identifying implementation strategies to help um, mitigate or reduce some of those risks. The first step within, within, this, um, within this goal area is to center community within um, developing solutions. The guide also recommends including into the larger picture uh, stressors and hazards that can contribute to displacement, such as extreme flooding, green infrastructure development policies or other large scale public investments within the area, population or housing cost increases in nearby neighborhoods, high energy and water bills, large renter populations, property tax increases, historic disinvestment and substandard housing conditions. Next slide, please. So this is the um, plan, do, check, and act uh, wheel that Jess had mentioned earlier. Next in the process is to develop an anti-displacement plan for some of those neighborhoods that are impacted by program or projects with guidance from displacement efforts while considering all of the different ways that pro programs or projects can better serve existing communities and avoid contributing to their uh, potential displacement. Team members involved within these practices should also be uh, uh, transparent about the likely impacts of a program or policy and be up, up front with the impacted communities or neighborhoods. Um, conversations such as discussing how property values may increase or how stormwater organization bills may, um, may go up. Um, and from those conversations, project team members should also work to make changes in response um, to increase community opportunities and mitigate those harms. Next slide, please. It's really important to recognize that combating displacement requires collective action. It's essential to collaborate with others that are involved within the program or within the project um, to develop uh, and facilitate a multi-agency conversation about the role that policy across local government and government agencies can help play. This step within the process also helps catalyze alignment for collective action and ongoing partnerships where it's possible within the development of the project. Next slide, please. Next, uh, the equity guide recommends developing and implementing an approach to evaluating the extent to which green infrastructure projects or portfolios um, can have, may have contributed to displacement. The equity guide can um, serve as a tool here to help walk um, through an evaluation roadmap shown on the screen to measure what matters within the community and within our respective stormwater management organizations or SMOs. The equity guide also helps provide um, survey questions um, for some of these um, uh, key elements to help gather um, important insights and information from um, project members that are involved from the stormwater management organization, but also from the community. Next slide, please. 
A key element of the equity guide is the inclusion of uh, what we call bright spots excuse me, bright spots, which highlight some of the lessons and learning that is currently underway within uh, the stormwater sector. Uh, one key example of a bright spot is uh, the historic old fourth ward uh, project in um, Atlanta. Uh, just for some context here, in 2011, Atlanta implemented a large scale green infrastructure project in the historic old fourth ward park as an alternative to a great infrastructure solution to help address combined sewer system capacity challenges and localized stormwater flooding issues. While the solution saved $14 million over the great infrastructure alternative and resolved local community flooding um, and created uh, approximately $475 million in economic development value, at the same time, the project uh, catalyzed higher taxes, resulting in significant gentrification and displacement for local low and uh, moderate income residents within the area. The Atlanta project team realized that they hadn't proactively considered and acted on ways to protect the community from displacement. From there, the city worked to take that lesson to heart. And within their next project, they worked with a team uh, associated with Invest Atlanta, the city's economic development authority to help create tax relief on the impacted property values invested in repairs on folks' uh, homes within the uh, project area and, and surrounding communities, and required robust community partnership um, throughout uh, the area. Next slide, please. All right, I think that's the end of it, um, of, of, our, of our panel. Um, Presentation, sorry. We hope that the brief overview of the Green Infrastructure Leadership Exchange and the Exchange's Equity Guide helps spark some new ideas for advancing equitable GSI projects within your communities and respective stormwater management organizations. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of our speakers. Um, we want to go ahead and take some questions and have our speakers and panelists answer your questions. We have a couple um, from our collaborative as well. And so, Deanna, um, can you, I just want to take a look at the chat here. Did any questions come out to you? Yeah, let me read out Tali, or, or Tali, I wonder if you want to take yourself off mute and read your own question out loud. It's um, some folks. Uh, there's others who'd like to have this answered as well. Okay, uh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think I wrote it as I meant to ask it, but I was just wondering, the, the first presenter talked a little bit about um, sort of the rather small um, in, uh, like increases in property values that were, that, that were tied directly to GSI investments, but I wondered if those GSI in investments also tend to come with improvements in, um, let's say, new trails, new open space, new parks, because the community is recognizing sort of the benefits of all these things. And so does that tend to have a greater impact or, um, you know, would that tend to lead to, to increased uh, chances for displacement and gentrification? Because it's probably not just GSI projects in a bubble. Does that make sense? That's how I wrote. <laughs> Thanks, Tally. Uh, well, I will say, so when we built the model to test the question of whether the G the distributed GSI was impacting property values, we did include the um, whether there were parks nearby as one of the factors in the uh, analysis. So we're, we're holding constant the presence of a park because we know that parks nearby increase value. Um, so we didn't we didn't test for the question you're asking, right? But we made sure that we were not, we tried to make sure we weren't accidentally like capturing the impact of a park. Um, I think we all know <laughs> once a neighborhood starts getting investment and attracts investors and has capacity, like this, you know, it becomes common. I, I, I live on one of those blocks, right? That where we got swales and then we got a bike lane and then it, it, it is, I think, something that happens. Um, it's not exactly what we studied uh, for that exact paper. Thanks. Does anyone else want to come off mute and ask any questions? Otherwise, I might hand it to Deanna. I know we have a couple of other questions, too. I, 
I have a question. Um, this is Flora Serna. Can you hear me all right? Yes. I can hear you, so, yes. Um, I'm with the Rio Fernando de Taos Revitalization Collaborative um, here in New Mexico. And um, my question is, you know, how might we engage with community members effectively and honestly if they, just like many of us, might not even be aware of the full extent of some of the ramifications of like this green infrastructure development for lack of a, a better term. I'm just trying to think honestly, like, do we tell them, hey, this could result in X, Y, Z ramifications for you and your families for generations to come? Like, how do we engage in that conversation honestly? I'm gonna to defer to my two colleagues, uh, Beatrice and Jess. So I think we'll be able to answer your question, Flora. Um, I can take a first stab at that and maybe punt it onto Jess. Um, so I think one, one of the key recommendations in the equity guide is working to have authentic and transparent conversations in order to really understand where, where that, where that perceived risk is coming from and where that, you know, like understanding like where those concerns are for the implementation of the project um, and also centering their voices and those concerns and all of the insights that you've gathered from the conversations um, in order to, to make sure that they're either addressed or at least acknowledged throughout the development of the project. Um, I think Jen mentioned early on, um, you know, in, in, in her presentation about how it's really critical that as practitioners, we start instead of like waiting for the end of the project to incorporate those elements, like bring them in from day one of the project. Um, and that's definitely something that, um, you know, the equity guide provides uh, tools and guidance and best practices on how to do, um, especially if, you know, you're a practitioner and you're maybe on the programmatic side of things, um, you know, and you may not necessarily be directly involved with community-based outreach. Um, there are a couple of like, key recommendations on how to start those conversations. I think it's also really important to acknowledge that having one conversation isn't going to lead to a solution or just like scheduling like one community organization meeting is, isn't going to just lead to a solution. I think it's really important to acknowledge how this is an iterative process. Um, you have to meet folks where they are and like where they're comfortable with and that involves like having introductory conversations, um, you know, setting up you know, historical context sometimes. And sometimes you, you know, you start, you get on like a really good track and you have to like restart those, those conversations, even though your project has like a deadline and is moving forward. But um, with the idea that as stormwater practitioners, we are dedicated and committed to advancing equitable, equitable green infrastructure solutions. I think it is a key component of the way that we move forward to, um, advance our projects. Um, and just I'll, I'll stop talking and punt it on to you if you have any additional insights there. Yeah, no, you did a great job. Um, yeah, I just want to reiterate that uh, uh, the participatory approach to the exchange. And it's participatory because we, though we're professionals, we're not coming in assuming we know everything about your community because they are the experts. And so they have as much a place on the stage for communication so they can voice their concerns. And that's what makes us unique and um, and is a really important part of uh, the equity portion of it. Thank you. I'll turn to um, Beth. Do you want to ask your question out loud? Beth Stewart. Or I'm happy to, okay. Wow, she's driving and managed to put together full sentences into the chat box. Let me go ahead and read it. Um, can you all share and follow up the best primer resource with evidence of displacement resulting from GSI projects to share with project proponents who might not be aware of this issue? So I... A resource that I use a lot is the Urban Displacement Project at UC Berkeley. Um, they have maps and tools and amazing publications. It's not about GSI specifically, right? Um, they've looked at transit. They've looked at a bunch of different similar investments. 
Um, but I, I think that's a, a, a starting point. Um, there's sort of something for everyone there. Uh, we can certainly follow up with more um, resources after. Uh, I, I, I will try to think of some specific ones. I have a very long uh, bibliography that I'm working from, so I don't know offhand which one I would recommend. Um, but I'll, I'll I'll think about it. If I could quickly add on there too, um, the equity guide uh, is a culmination of a lot of um, com uh, community-based uh, interviews and conversations, as well as a very in-depth literature review um, centered around the um, seven goal areas that uh, Jessica set up earlier. Um, and so if you were to navigate to the equity guide, um, one of the appendices is um, the actual literature review and interview insights. And so there's a link there of the different resources and community-based conversations that were had around um, the preventing displacement goal area. Our, our um, lead author for the Project Green Print Partners set up a very handy dandy summary of all of the resources that they reviewed, as well as a link to all of the um, authoritative uh, resources and best practices associated with that. Um, I can drop a link to that specific document in the chat as well, but it is a, a component of the equity guide as a larger tool. Thank you, Beatrice, I appreciate that. Um, I wonder if there's another question. We have a question from our collaborative members. And that is um, given that the solutions oftentimes come down to coordination between stormwater departments, housing interests within a community, you know, within a, a municipality, workforce development interests. Um, how can community organizations encourage different local government departments to work together and coordinate their efforts into a larger anti-displacement? Um, you know, with an anti-displacement goal, um, with stormwater being part of that, like how do outside organizations help make that happen within municipalities when it's not already happening? Wonder if you have any suggestions. It's uh, interesting that that, uh, you know, that finding sort of came out uh, loud and clear in a recent study that we published uh, on the state of uh, public sector green stormwater infrastructure implementation in the United States. The idea that to have a successful program, you must first really have strong leadership and strong cross-departmental cooperation. And without that, uh, you know, policy and funding and everything that follows from it is really, um, you know, uh, secondary without that primary leadership component. And so at the end of that guide, which is also available uh, from the, uh, the link that was shared at the end of the presentation um, on our resources page of the website, uh, one of the recommendations for community agencies is advocacy, um, you know, to take those findings and go to local governments and say, you know, without your leadership, without your buy-in, um, it is gonna be very hard for any of us to accomplish the important goals of um, using GSI for all of its, you know, many purposes of managing stormwater uh, and providing co-benefits, but also of preventing uh, gentrification. We all have to work together. And so I know that uh, my colleagues, uh, Beatrice and Jess and all of the other members of the exchange, um, you know, uh, would gladly uh, participate in a conversation with any community organization that wanted some help with advocacy uh, because uh, it's desperately needed. Thank you. I see Irma's hand raised and I think we have time for this one last question. And if you want, keep dropping your questions in the chat. I can follow up with our panelists afterward and we can they can answer questions and I can email that out as part of the follow-up to this session. So Irma, if you wanna come off mute, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, yes. Um, so it's a question and a statement, but um, I'm wondering if you factor in, the, so one of the things I look, we, I look at is the cost uh, of flooding and those impacts because the communities that are, I think, impacted the most from flooding 
are low income and black communities. And so green infrastructure is meant to address that to some extent. It's not a, it's not a 100% solution, but it is intended to address that. And so is that factored in when we're looking at cost and benefits? You know, I know that, you know, property value increase is a thing. It's real. Displacement is real. Um, but I, you know, I just don't want communities to be afraid to do this because of that fear and then are impacted by the, the outcomes of intense rain. Right. So how do you factor it? Yeah. yeah, I really appreciate that question. And um, CNT did some research a few years ago now looking at the, the distribution of flood insurance claims in Chicago and found that really, you know, black and brown communities are facing the damage and have not historically had a fair share of investment, right? So the basement flooding has a health impact. It can impact your insurance rates, it can destabilize you as a household, and then across the neighborhood that destabilizes. And so cnt.org, you can see more of our work there, but I would just say um, the the flood uh, value <laughs> is not in those numbers I presented, right? The flood abatement value, um, because we were, we were looking um, at such small GSI types that they aren't necessarily addressing the 100 year flood or whatever. Um, but when a community is considering this infrastructure investment, that has to be part of the conversation um, as both the pro and the con, right? And, and what to do to mitigate that destabilization. Thank you so much for the questions. Thank you for to our panelists for answering the questions and bringing your resources with you today. Um, I am going to go back to my slides. Um, so I know that this I know that this work takes time um, and and a lot of effort. You're hearing today that there you know it's complicated and there are lots of steps and lots of coordination. And so we do have some more additional resources for you know, equity, diversity, and inclusion in, um, in conservation and environmental work. So um, I think we can drop some of these links in the chat too, of just like where to get started and how to engage with community members effectively. Some of that is covered in these resources as well as the, the background of um, how racial equity is, is important as, as to that last question um, that, that Irma brought up. Um, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, we are the Urban Waters Learning Network. You can find us um, at www.urbanwaterslearningnetwork.org. We are a small but mighty team of four. You can contact any one of us on the slide. Diana, Maria is on the call today too. Hi, Maria, myself, and John Valent. So Groundwork USA and River Network co-coordinate the Urban Waters Learning Network. Please make sure that to share your, your to take a couple moments and share your feedback on this training session as well. It's really helpful to us as we develop these moving forward. I will be in touch with um, this recording, the slides, and perhaps some follow-up questions and some of those resources that were asked for as well. So we'll we'll send all of those out in a follow-up. Thank you so much for being here and have a great day, everybody. Thank you.